we would all like to believe that our judgment is balanced and neutral. But then there are those times when we realize that actually we believe what we want to believe and our existing beliefs bias how we look at new information. Now this human tendency has intrigued both artists and scholars. An excellent example of the artistic exploration of this theme can be found in the 2008 movie Doubt. The plot revolves around two characters at odds with each other. Father Flynn, a priest at a Catholic school who wants the school to embrace progressive ideas about education. And Sister Aloysius, the school's stern headmaster who doesn't appreciate Father Flynn's deviation from tradition. She even instructs the school staff to keep an eye on him. Meanwhile, Father Flynn takes special interest in the school's first black student, Donald Miller, but some people view this relationship with suspicion. One day, a teacher, Sister James, notices Donald in tears after a meeting with Father Flynn. She brings her concerns to Sister Aloysius that Donald may have been abused. Now, one would expect Sister Aloysius to be devastated about the possible abuse of one of her students. But instead, she seems to be glad to finally have confirmation about her doubts regarding Father Flynn. The lack of any solid proof that Father Flynn is involved in any wrongdoing does not deter Sister Aloysius from conducting a witch hunt against him. You have the slightest proof of anything. But I have my certainty. In Sister Aloysius' actions, we see a classic case of what psychologists refer to as the confirmation bias. In this video, we take a look at the definitions and history of the bias, followed by its causes and some of its risks and benefits, and finally, ways to manage the bias. If you like the video, do share and subscribe to see more videos on similar topics. Now, let's get started. Confirmation bias is our tendency to easily and readily confirm our pre-existing beliefs and hypotheses. We do this in one of three ways. Firstly, while evaluating a statement, we may look for the wrong kind of information, which doesn't help us confirm or disconfirm the statement. For example, let's assume for a moment that you don't know anything about cakes and you are told to verify the statement that all cakes are sweet. Now you would go out and try cakes and it is likely that you would only find sweet cakes. After all, most of them are sweet. After trying a number of sweet cakes, you might come to the conclusion that all cakes must be sweet. But a better strategy would be to look specifically for non-sweet cakes. As it doesn't matter how many sweet cakes you come across, a single non-sweet cake can disconfirm the rule. Secondly, when we receive new information about a belief, our interpretation of the information is often influenced by what we already believe or want to believe. For example, people tend to evaluate the performance of a government or a leader based on whether they voted for them or not. And lastly, our memory may fail us by only providing us information that supports our present beliefs. Similarly, our attention may trick us by focusing on information that supports our beliefs. These phenomena are referred to as selective memory and selective perception, respectively. An early example of the historical recognition of the confirmation bias can be seen in the Italian poet Dante's famous work, The Divine Comedy, wherein he noted, Opinion, hasty, often can incline to the wrong side, and then affection for one's own opinion binds, confines the mind. In modern psychology, confirmation bias was first described in the 1960s by P.C. Wasson. In one of his most famous experiments, known as the Wasson Selection Task, participants were presented four cards, each with a number on one side and a letter on the other, although only one side is seen at a time. Let's consider the visible side of the following cards. And a conditional rule that if a card has a vowel on one side, it has an even number on the other side. The task for the participants was to identify those cards and only those cards 
which they would want to flip and see the other side to evaluate whether the rule is valid. Take a moment to think how many and which cards would you want to turn to verify the rule. The correct answer is to flip I, which must reveal an even number if the rule is true, and 3, which must not reveal a vowel. Now the task is simple enough when you think about it, but surprisingly the success rate is only 20%. The most common errors are the unnecessary inclusion of the even card and the failure to include the odd card. The even card does not really reveal any useful information about the rule as the rule does not need to apply in reverse for it to be true, whereas the odd card can actually disconfirm the rule if the flip side reveals a vowel. In the next section, we look at the various causes of the confirmation bias. Causes of a behavioral bias may either be cognitive or neural. Let's start with the cognitive causes, which are the psychological mechanisms that contribute to the bias. Now it is likely that no one of the multiple psychological causes can explain all the instances of the confirmation bias and that each cause is valid in some cases while being invalid in others. First, the role of cognitive dissonance, which is the discomfort we experience when there is a contradiction between what we believe and what we do or experience. If our experiences support our existing beliefs, we feel positive emotions. But if our experiences contradict our existing beliefs, we feel negative emotions. Therefore, to avoid negative emotions, we have a preference towards confirmatory information. Secondly, some researchers suggest that our thoughts and actions are limited by time, motivation and other mental resources. So we only consider one hypothesis at a time and even for that hypothesis only one possibility, either it being true or it being false but not both at the same time. And once we are satisfied with our consideration of one possibility, we may not even proceed to the consideration of all the other possibilities. This pattern of thought constricts open-ended exploratory thought and enables a narrow confirmatory way of thinking. Next, the view that we learn confirmation bias right from early childhood through observations and socialization. In most cultures, significant importance is given to defending and rationalizing one's own beliefs and actions, but not on doubting one's beliefs or thinking of reasons that could be given against their beliefs. And finally, the view that belief is the default state of mind and disbelief tends to be an exception rather than the rule. Researchers have observed that in the absence of compelling evidence either supporting or contradicting a statement, people are more inclined to assume that the statement is true rather than to assume that it is false. Even asking people to imagine reasons why a random statement might be true makes them more likely to believe that it is true. Now let's look at the neural causes, which are the brain functions or other biological functions that contribute to the bias. Two brain regions have been observed to be involved in confirmation bias. First, striatum is the part of the brain which helps us learn the risks and rewards of actions and validity of beliefs by keeping a tab of the negative and positive cases in our experience. Second, prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain which remembers and maintains our beliefs. Ideally, there should only be one direction of communication between the two parts, that is, the striatum based on evaluation of evidence informs the prefrontal cortex which beliefs are true and must be maintained and which are false and need to be rejected. But communication in the other direction has also been observed wherein the beliefs in prefrontal cortex influence and modify the learning process in striatum such that it supports pre-existing beliefs while evaluating evidence. In the next section, let's look at some of the risks and benefits of the bias. Let's start with the benefits. After all, for the bias to be passed down to us from our ancestors, either genetically or culturally, it must be beneficial in certain conditions. 
In many cases, learning by accumulating evidence from our own experience may be difficult. For example, in cases where risks and rewards are too far in the future, such as the rewards of long-term savings or the risks of smoking tobacco. In such situations, acquiring fully formed beliefs from external sources is more advantageous than learning from our own experience. This strategy would have been especially successful in cooperative groups such as tribes in which our early ancestors lived. In such groups there would be very little reasons to doubt the intentions of other group members. Another view is that evolution has not geared us towards the highest standards of science or logic but rather towards survival and survival requires us to identify potential rewards and avoid costly errors. So when we do perceive a possibility of an attractive reward or a costly error, we overtly focus on it to try to explore that possibility further. And finally, some researchers have observed that socially skilled persons use a confirmation strategy in social situations, wherein they form early hypotheses about the personality of a new individual they meet and then ask matching questions to confirm the hypotheses. Now let's turn our attention towards the risks or the undesirable impacts of the bias on individuals as well as society as a collective. When information is presented sequentially over time, people tend to form beliefs based on early information and then confirm those beliefs with information presented later, thus giving more importance to first impressions. This is known as the primacy effect concurring with the ancient wisdom that first impression is often the last impression. Secondly, once a belief or opinion has been formed, it can be very difficult to change, even in the face of strong evidence that it is wrong. This is the reason why people's political worldviews, religious beliefs and prejudices against communities often don't change their entire lives in spite of encountering contradictory information. Next, social media platforms show individuals information that they are more likely to agree with while excluding opposing views, thus amplifying confirmation bias. Indeed, individuals themselves limit their information sources to those that support their pre-existing beliefs. Now, this leads to attitude polarization, wherein people sit at the extreme ends of opinions without any middle ground. Lastly, people tend to have exaggerated beliefs about their own abilities, a tendency known as overconfidence bias. Now, confirmation bias amplifies overconfidence bias as people subjectively interpret new information to support their biased and exaggerated self-beliefs. In the last section, let's look at some of the ways we can manage our own confirmation bias in situations where undesirable effects are likely. While it is difficult to suppress or eliminate confirmation bias, researchers have found that people can learn the value of looking for disconfirming evidence. This learning process can be strengthened by promoting a general skepticism in the society through education and other cultural means. This would mean that people learn not to accept the validity of any statement from any source without further thought or investigation. Secondly, the only condition where people push themselves towards considering multiple points of views and anticipating all the combinations and possibilities is when they know in advance that they will have to explain themselves to others who are well informed. Therefore, by promoting a culture of debates and discussions in public forums, we can nudge people towards a more exploratory thinking instead of confirmatory thought. Next, when new information about a pre-existing belief is presented sequentially, the pre-existing belief repeatedly comes to mind every time a new piece of information is presented, thus amplifying the confirmation bias towards it. But when new information is presented simultaneously, then people concentrate on comparing, integrating and evaluating all the new information together, thus reducing confirmation bias and the focus on the pre-existing belief. Lastly, confirmation bias allows for a shallow analysis of new information wherein contradictory evidence is casually dismissed rather than seriously analyzed and integrated. 
Therefore, if we make people pay more attention to new information, confirmation bias will be reduced. Now counterintuitively, one way of doing this is to make new information harder to process so that it takes more effort to analyze it and thus people have to pay more attention. And to conclude, let's look back at the example of Sister Aloysius. In the case of her doubts regarding Father Flynn, she actively searched for information to confirm her beliefs by asking the staff to keep an eye on him. She hastily interpreted information to support her beliefs, such as the incident of Donald crying, interpreted to mean that he was abused by the father. And she focused only on the suspicious aspects of Father Flynn, in spite of many people's insistence on his good qualities and lack of any incriminating evidence against him. If she entertained the possibility that she is wrong and considered all the evidence on the same footing, she may have seen things differently. Go watch the movie to find out what happened to Father Flynn and Sister Aloysius. And now it's your turn. Tell us in the comments below how confirmation bias has affected your decisions and behaviors. And I hope your initial hypothesis that this video was worth a watch has been confirmed. See you next time.